Cool. Okay, so the first test of the day is uh, hand, a handheld mic. There you go. Dead easy. Um, and a clicker as well. So if I go tumbling over because the concentration required is too high, then um, please be gentle with me. So, um, yeah, Thing Monk doesn't do uh, mediocre talks. So um, what I did was I thought I would agonize, uh, agonize long and hard over uh, what to talk to you about this morning. And um, what I've tried to do is put together really three things that I love. So um, one of them is working out how technology uh, fits together. So I spent, well actually I turned 20 in IBM terms on Friday, so I spent the last 20 years uh, worrying about that and enjoying myself doing it. The other thing is uh, the industry that I serve. So in my role at IBM, I get to worry about the right technical things uh, happening for all of our customers in the industrial uh, sector, which any of you familiar with that mean that can mean anything from people who make cars to people who do mining, oil and gas, all of those things. So lots and lots of different things to go and make and do and lots and lots of opportunity for talking about uh, how, digi how digital can help them um, change things. And the other piece of this was uh, what at least a few, uh, no, no few number in the uh, room know as the, the edge of network, which is kind of been a bit lost in the noise of the whole IoT thought, but is an integral part of it. So what I wanted to do this morning is talk a little bit about that, talk about how it fits into the uh, structure of an Internet of Things architecture, but also what it means uh, for an industry like the one that I serve. So uh, hopefully I will um, manage to keep up the, uh, the high standard, but please be kind, don't throw things if I don't. Okay, so things. So I was thinking about uh, the things that we typically looked at um, from an industrial perspective and how we treated them over the years. And we kind of did things the hard way for a long time. So um, in, the, in the very, very early days, well, we just let things break and then dealt with, the, dealt with the consequences of doing that. So that might be a burst pipe, it might be a um, uh, something like an oil, you know, something even more serious like an oil pipeline, etc., etc., etc. We just let it break and then go and deal with the consequences and go and fix it. Um, clearly that's going to cost us a lot of money very, very quickly and not the most effective way of doing stuff. So then what we did um, is we moved into a model of what you might call um, scheduled maintenance. So we would go and look after our things on a basis of visiting them regularly, uh, whether they needed it or not, uh, and replacing various things. So uh, the nearest analogy that I could draw to this is like when you go and take your car uh, to the garage for a service, they'll replace various different things on it every year, every six months, to, you know, your, your manufacturer may vary, that kind of thing. But then we started to get a little bit smarter about it uh, and started to instrument those things. So rather than just letting things go pop or replacing things unnecessarily, actually uh, things started to get a little bit more interesting when we said, well actually let's start measuring things. So let's look at, uh, in this case, um, the flow, the, you know, the, the, the flow of water through the pipe and see what's happening there. Let's look at um, the, the, the pressure in the hydraulics that we're using to uh, assemble a, a powertrain or an engine in a factory, those kind of things. And then actually, once we start doing that, we can start looking for various different trends that say, well, actually, you know, maybe we don't need to go and visit this particular um, thing for eight months rather than six because we know that perhaps we've been using it less and it's not due for uh, any remedial attention for a while. So on this spectrum, generally speaking, we reckon there's a tenfold difference between these things. So uh, from the least expensive end, it's ten times more expensive to do uh, scheduled maintenance and then ten times more expensive to just let the thing go bang in the first place. So that pro pro thought process uh, led to, uh, I guess, what you will, um, you will all recognise, or a lot of you will recognise as being kind of the classic uh, sort of IoT thought. So you have um, some kind of remote site where we've instrumented our thing, we've put a sensor onto it, uh, and then a headquarters. So in the old days, we used to talk about people with their own data centres, uh, enterprise service buses, and all of that good um, corporate IT stuff. Now, typically, we're talking about some kind of um, cloud in the back end that's doing the data collection. And the thought there was, 
well, actually, we can measure things at the edge. We can stand next to the pipe. We can read the pressure. But actually, what's really, really valuable is if you can take those readings and you can start plugging them into uh, all manner of systems that sit in the back of an organization and help things run. So uh, it might be a sales order processing system. It might even be some simple dashboards. So we're trying to look at how well or otherwise our factory, our refinery, um, whatever it is we're measuring, our fleet, and see how well or otherwise they're performing. So when we did this, uh, we kind of turned on uh, the fire hydrant uh, and aimed all this sensor data at the, uh, at the back end. And the thing is, we learned, we learned a few things. Um, what do you know? We learned some things. Um, so the first thing is, um, yeah, there's, there's, kind of, there's kind of a two-edged sword of, of seeing everything that's going on at the edge of the network, or if, if you like, the very extremes of the network. So um, on the one hand, it's great. You can see uh, data flowing off of just about every sensor that you've got in your environment. But the downside is you can see all the data that you're seeing flowing off of uh, every sensor of your environment. So you end up with a, a kind of a wood for the trees problem. Uh, and particularly in the early days, uh, what we found was that suddenly you were absolutely hosing the systems that sit uh, underpinning your organization. And it became very, very difficult to work out actually what to do with that data. It became almost kind of a problem in itself. The other piece of this is if you've got a um, uh, a distributed environment. And when we talk about things, very often we're talking about not just things that are sat next to us on the desk, we might do, um, but quite often, particularly in industrial circles, you're talking about things like a, uh, a pumping station that sat somewhere in the desert um, where nobody would even think to put you know, things like a, uh, a fast, uh, you know, wide area network, 4G, that kind of stuff. And particularly in the early days when we started looking at this, um, we found that actually the networks that we were having to use uh, to communicate uh, often were things that were typically quite unreliable but usually quite slow and expensive as well. So think satellite comms, that kind of stuff. Um, and, and if you're just aimlessly blasting back data that you don't know whether it's um, useful or not at the back end, then actually that cost escalates very, very quickly and starts to undermine uh, the benefits of that instrumentation at the edge of the, uh, the edge of the network. The other piece of this you've got is um, it's quite one thing to be able to sense things. And again, um, one of the things I've noticed looking at, if you like, the modern kind of IoT discourse is that we talk a lot about sensing things, but we don't talk quite so much about responding once we sense things. And that may be a ref reflection on uh, the fact that I think we're still, or the industry as a whole, is still learning uh, about what this technology is all about. But um, if you want to do something useful, you know, the ability to respond at the very edge, the very extreme of your uh, environment. If you're always having to send all the data back up to the cloud, think about it for a little bit, and then send something back down, well, then actually that all, that all takes time and, and rules out certain things. And then actually, yeah, good old-fashioned common sense um, was another part of this. Common sense, who knew? Um, and, and so, for example, if I've got um, uh, in, a, in a pumping station, I've got some, a sensor there measuring uh, the pressure in a water pipe, and I've got a valve uh, two feet to the left of it, then it seems a little bit counterintuitive that when I've spotted that the pressure has dropped uh, to a level below which I'm comfortable, that I have to go toddling off to the cloud, do a little bit of thinking, come all the way back down again, just to turn on the valve that's you know, a couple of feet to the left in the pipe. So um, good old fashioned common sense was one of the other things that had us scratching our heads about uh, what we should do about this. And so what we then started to think about was, well, actually, as well as the, the sensors themselves, it makes more sense to put enough compute power down at the very edge of the network so that we can actually do some useful work. Now, there's, a, there's an interesting balance that you've got to strike here, because um, if you think of the remote site perhaps as being something like uh, a, a, a power station or um, an oil pipeline or something, then clearly you're not going to have a data center down there. That's just, that's just not going to fly. But you might have some um, low-powered, simple um, compute power. So I've used, for illustra illustrative purposes, I've used the Raspberry Pi here. But there's a spectrum, of different, um, a spectrum of different possibilities, clearly. 
But actually, in this architecture, what we started to do was to say, well, by having some compute power deployed down at the uh, very edge of the network, what we can start doing is taking those feeds, so taking those raw sensor feeds, and actually start making sense of them before we start going toddling off to the center, uh, off to the center, so to the cloud uh, or to the back end. Um, and this does a few things. The first thing is you start moving from just thinking all, all you know, just blasting data at the, um, uh, at the data center and at the mothership and, and hoping that somebody can work out uh, whether there's anything useful in there. You actually start working towards, rather than it being fine-grained data flowing back, you start moving into a world where you're talking about actionable insight. So, for example, in this case, we might have a combination of vibration uh, and flow, and the edge can work out, or the processing power at the edge says, well, actually, when the flow is at this rate and the vibration is at this rate, ah, that means that uh, in a minute we're going we're gonna to spring a leak or we've already got a leak or something like that. So rather than the message flying back into the mothership being, here's the, here's the vibration, here's the pressure, actually the message that goes back, send an engineer, the pumping station is just about to have a failure. Now clearly, uh, from a, um, a separation of concerns uh, perspective, um, that's going to be a much, much more effective way of using the bandwidth of structuring the systems that sit behind it. The other piece of this was, of course, you're using the wire a lot more efficient, efficiently. So you could be taking as many readings as you like um, with, with whatever cadence as you want down at the edge, and all of a sudden you're not using up oodles of expensive, potentially slow and difficult um, bandwidth to get your work done. Uh, and the other, the other piece of this, of course, is, well, what happens if that link breaks? So if we're already dealing with um, uh, a fragile network where uh, a failure is, is kind of anticipated, um, then uh, you, know, you, you, you might plan for that anyway. But, but this might be something like uh, a store where we're expecting sort of fast, plentiful network, and it's actually an unexpected failure. By being able to do more work down at this end of the, uh, this end of the spectrum, then clearly we've got the possibility to at least keep that instrumented world running even when the, uh, the umbilical cord back to the, uh, the mothership has gone and therefore more possibility. So you can start putting together things in combination, do more automation, that good, all that good stuff. Um, this can vary in complexity. So again, there's a variety of different options you've got in terms of putting compute power down at the edge. In my career, I've seen probably about five. Uh, at the simple end, some simple filtering and aggregation. So if um, you know, we're, we're taking readings every one second, uh, off, a, uh, off a pressure meter or something, well, actually, we might just want to send an aggregated view every half an hour or an hour. So dead simple stuff. Um, yeah, some simple flow control, maybe um, some mediation. So taking the raw uh, sensor format and turning it, to, turning it into something a bit more general purpose um, so that it's easier to process at the center. And I'm sure there's plenty of Node-RED um, fans in the audience who will recognize that. Um, the other thing you find is that uh, and I've worked with customers in the past who have actually used the edge to do meaningful integration of applications. So rather than um, using the, the corporate integration infrastructure, actually what we've done is we've deployed very, very simple integration. So think about something like Mosquito, say, deployed right down at the edge of the network. That means we can actually have uh, a really efficient way of creating uh, IT right at the edge of the network applications that run in that domain but don't necessarily run in the head office. Um, stream analytics, a little bit more complex, so when we're starting to look at things like trends, so you know, we know that our um, pressure is following a particular um, speed and course, uh, a particular trajectory, we might, we might want to take some action or, or trigger an alert on that basis, so um, no doubt some of you in the audience have played with things like quarks that look at that kind of stuff. Um, and, and I guess at the, at the kind of the more extreme end, uh, we have seen cases where people have actually been doing really quite a lot of heavy lifting with, with things like media. So, um, for example, there's, there's one company um, we've, we've worked with in the past who have actually used um, sound, the, 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 wave, the wave patterns triggered by sound flowing in a water pipe to detect when there's a hole in the pipe. So when you've got a clean length of pipe, you emit a ping, a little bit like, uh, like you would hear on a submarine. Uh, and in normal circumstances, that gets reflected cleanly back to uh, a sound sensor, well actually when there's a swirl in the pipe caused by a hole, 
it actually alters the waveform. So what this particular organization were doing was taking the recordings of those pings, actually doing really quite um, sophisticated number crunching, but then what was happening was they were boiling all of that down to have we got a hole or not in the pipe. So sliding scale of, uh, sliding scale of complexity, sliding scale of compute power that you need to do it. And this is Martin Gale's uh, curve here. This is, this is my experience. This isn't a, 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 you know, a kind of an official curve. I'm happy to be uh, argued with about it. OK, so from a design perspective, um, very, few, very few of the IoT reference architectures for stuff actually really talk about the edge very much. This collection of things is uh, some work that um, I and some colleagues did uh, about 18 months or so ago uh, within IBM to think about IoT, but also think about um, the edge as a, an architecture in its own right. A lot of the reference architectures that you see out there put all of this stuff into one box. Um, this is a system too, and you need to worry about it. So how do we fix it? Uh, what do we build our applications out of? What's the runtime? What device do we need? Who installs and fixes it? Amazing how often people forget that. Uh, and there's one more. Hey, who can access it? And how? How do we fix it? We've screwed something to the wall. You'd be amazed how many big companies forget about this stuff. So, won't dwell too long on it, but if people are interested, come and find me. Um, in industrial, we talk about uh, industry 4.0, which is one of those um, sort of marketing terms uh, that industry throws at us every now and again. Um, and essentially, this is about the, the emergence of a fourth industrial revolution around what people are calling cyber physical systems. Um, and so, if you look at this continuum here, um, you know, first industrial revolution where we started using steam, water power, uh, those kind of things, mechanical production equipment. Then we moved into uh, mass production in the late, um, the late 1800s, 19th century. In the 60s and 70s, what we did was we essentially uh, used machines and computers to automate what humans did, but in a fairly repetitive, uh, uh, processy way. What we're talking about with cyber-physical systems is a set of things, um, and cyber-physical is possibly a little bit misleading. Effectively, it's all about saying, well, in the third industrial revolution, we started introducing ele electronics, and now we're going to start doing smarter stuff. So we're talking about flexible manufacturing, so flexible manufacturing, things like 3D printing, things about having a reconfigurable factory, the fact that you can respond to something that's happened, uh, and rather than having a static production line, you can actually start doing some intelligent things. Uh, inter Internet of people and things, clearly. Um, Internet of things, well, why we're all here today, but also the people in that. So how can we empower uh, the people that work in, in, in industry to be more effective? Autonomous systems, systems that can um, look after themselves, require less feeding and watering. Um, analytics and cognitive, if you like, the, the smarts, the engine that sits behind uh, the decision making and some of that automation. Uh, and Internet of Services as well. So I think Sam, right from the, from, from the beginning, started talking about the power of APIs. Well, actually, for a lot of uh, industrial organizations, they're actually now start, starting to think about, well, we used to make and sell products. Now we could be digitizing those and turning them into um, services. And it costs big money, actually. There's a lot of huge, there's huge costs associated with um, understanding what's going on uh, in, 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 in industry. So in automotive, for example, if you stop a production line, that costs tens of thousands of pounds in certain cases per minute. That's a, big, that's a very, very big number when you add it up over the course of a year. Some manufacturers, it's even more. And in some cases, you're talking about five to 10 minutes lost a day. So you can do the sums and realize that's actually quite a big number. And for a lot of the organizations we talk to, amazingly, um, they don't know uh, when the production line will halt. It halts, and they go, oh, it stopped. OK, what happened? Oh, the pressure was too much. Oh, well, uh, OK, we better try and get things going again. So it's amazing, huge cost and actually very, very little insight to do with what's going on. And what we say to these customers, so again, if you take an example of, uh, say, somebody manufacturing an engine, you have highly pressurized uh, machines putting the pieces of an engine together, well, when those pressures hit a certain threshold, it will stop a production line because uh, a, 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 a sort of self-regulation mechanism says, well, actually, we've gone over the prescribed uh, pressure limit for assembling this engine, so I'm going to stop things until we've fixed whatever it is that's been going wrong. Typically, what we say to people is, well, in the first instance, well, let's just try and understand the trend. We're already measuring pressure. Um, let's perhaps measure a few other things as well. Let's attach 
uh, a temperature sensor. Let's um, start thinking about vibration, sound, and various other things, and assemble those things at the edge. So we might get a feed off of the piece of equipment that says this is the current pressure, uh, but also we put it together with the, the temperature and vibration. So let's just start gathering some information and visualize it in a, uh, in a meaningful way. Because then what you can do is you can start creating automated systems that say, you know, like stream analysis, those kind of things that we could deploy at the edge that say, well, when we see this trend, we think that that piece of equipment is going to cause a halt in the production line, perhaps in the next six hours, something like that. So all of a sudden, you've gone from, oh my god, the thing stopped, now what have we got to do, to actually being able to start to make some um, informed decisions. So if you wind that forward, I guess what we're talking about is, if we're talk talking about, say, a smarter factory manufacturing, say like a cutting tool, something like this, well, actually what we might do is measure sound, vibration, temperature associated with that cutting tool. Again, this is a real example um, from an organization we're talking to. Um, and then what we do is we come up with a synthesis of those readings. So if we follow the adoption path that we talked about in the previous, uh, the, 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 the previous slide, actually we've worked out that there's a combination of sound, vibration and temperature, or maybe even a couple of those things that indicate in the next 24 hours that cutting head is going to break. Now that cutting head breaking might have a seismic impact on the work orders that we're trying to ship. You know, that could mean massive business, that could mean, that could mean um, delays, that could mean SLA breaches, it can mean all sorts of horrible, expensive, uh, litigious stuff. Um, but actually what we can do is we can say, well that's happening, and we know that we have a two hour maintenance window tonight. So what we're going to do is we can say, well look, it's going to break in the next 24 hours, we know that it might not be broken by the time that two hour um, schedule uh, change window comes up, but actually what we'll do is we'll replace it anyway, because it's far better to replace it and, you know, when it's nearly worn out rather than let it go bang and stop the production line. And then what we might do downstream, and this is where it starts to get really cool, um, is you might actually re reconfigure the factory uh, and, um, and actually say, well, the production line is going to take shape we might route the traffic to a different cell and do things differently. So, I've uh, indulged you enough now, I think, um, with the things that I, I like to make and do. I say thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Hope I haven't lowered the tone and the uh, standard too much. Mm -hmm.